gustaría regresar a algo que se mencionó en la primera sesión. En la primera sesión, el capitán Arnest hablaba sobre liderazgo de una visión compartida. La importancia de una visión compartida en el liderazgo. Esto, que lo que puedo, que es lo que puedo resumir del primer panel, eh, representando cómo es que eh, el profesor mencionó que cómo puede pasar desde un liderazgo basado en valores hacia los valores manifestados en el mundo real. To bring us to this fellowship that we have as Americans, this fellowship that we share as people of the sea, right? we have a responsibility, I think, to communicate our shared understanding of the importance of the sea, because we see the world this way. When we look at a map, when we look at a chart, we orient ourselves to the ocean. But the rest of the, rest of the population does not see it the way that we see it. And I think it's important then to communicate with others why we think this is so vital. Vital to our service, vital to our nation, and I think also vital to the international system that we depend on. So how do you do this? Let's talk about that. Well, uh, these are my views. And I'll just give you a quick sense of my background first. I'll talk about the stuff behind the scenes and why this is important for uh, communicating to others the importance of the ocean. I'll talk about freedom of navigation and then I'll ask you to take the challenge. So I started at the Naval Academy uh, in Naples, Maryland. I understand that Admiral Bullock is uh, class of 1987. Uh, I went to aviation training and to the Viking from aircraft carriers. This is a peaceful platform designed for surface search and for intercepting warfare. And then, like most naval officers, you go to Afghanistan, right? So uh, I had this other experience that explains more of the way that I think about the world. I went to Washington, D.C., uh, went back out to sea, went to a carrier area again. But then I came out of the operational navy and I went for Estados tienen la 
It shows that every country, every coastal state is entitled to be a 12 nautical mile territorial fee. And that every state is also entitled for resources to claim an exclusive designation to go on out to 200 nautical miles. Not sovereign space, no, but a space for the management of the because we understand how vital the ocean is to our economy for fishing, for extraction of gas, for extraction of uh, other non-living resources from the seabed and the sea itself. But from our own naval theory, we understand that the sea is not just about resources. The sea is not just about what we can pull out of it and extract for our economy. The sea is what pulls us together. The sea is the bridge between our nations. And as Alfred Thayer Mahan, a naval theorist, a former naval officer who had much worthy experience himself, says he sees the the ocean as a great highway, as a wide common, a common place where all of humanity is able to transit. And we all know as we just go outside this auditorium and look at what is out there on the water line, we see the shipping containers, right? We see the big and we know where those are coming from and where those are going to. They're going to travel on these sea lanes on the wide continent along straight up around the world. And this is vital to you, vital to me, this is vital to our national economy, and it's very important to the communication between all states in the but it's under threat. There is a threat today to this fundamental aspect of the international system. And we might think about it in these terms. The territorial sea that we define today as 12 nautical miles was once upon a time defined as, defined by, the cannon shot rule, the distance that a cannon would fire would be approximately the distance that you would fire. Right? You have sovereign control over this water space that you can fire and defend. And we've seen many cannons over the last few days that give us these reminders. But there had been a change in the international system. It was very difficult, very difficult to finalize an agreement internationally as to what the territorial scheme would be. The 1958 Geneva Convention on the Laws of the Sea failed. It was unable to come to an agreement on a standard definition of the territorial sea. It took many more years of negotiation. It took a decade in the 70s until the 1982 the UN Convention on the Laws of the Sea. We were able to achieve an agreement that it would be 12 nautical miles. But the number of states in the international system has increased. This graphic goes from on the bottom from 1958 to present. And you'll see that the number of states in the world has increased from approximately 80 to 150. There are many more states now seeking a piece of the sea. And also, there are many more states who are, uh, who are making claims that are acceptable, claims that are exceeding the norm. And so what we see actually is that some of these states are 
Uh, there was an increase in the number of excessive territorial sea claims, but then right around the time that the, the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea was passed in 1982, the states are now abiding by the UN Convention. The states are now uh, normalizing to 12 nautical miles. But what is that? There is now an increase in something else. Because the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea created that provision for the EEZ. This is a new provision. The exclusive economic zone, which gives the state the right to extract and rebuild the best of the nautical miles, has increased over time. States are saying they are dictating what can and cannot occur in the EEZ. Some states, however, are territorializing the sea. You can think of it as seeking more and more sovereignty, not jurisdiction, but sovereignty over the space. And if we return to the idea of the Canada, I would argue that the extent to which the states are seeking to control more of the sea is a function of technology. Es un tema de tecnología de la función de lo lejos que pueden llegar con sus armas en el mundo de un mundo de las ideas cruzadas que pueden llegar hasta los cientos de personas millas, podríamos ver este incremento aún más y más. So we care about this because globalization is an essential fact of our lives. Some of you are going to leave today and you're going to go to the grocery store on your own. Right? You've got some errands to run, and you might go to the wish shopping market. Long, okay? Big, big super, supermarket. These goods have come in from the base. The capital for it is funded in another, contributed to from another place. The hands, the labor that are making it, in yet another place. All of this is distributed around the world, but made possible by the wide government, made possible by the superhighway of the ocean. As long as it is free, right? as long as there is freedom of navigation, this system will work. But without freedom of navigation, this system becomes unstable. Of course, we know that we know that having a freedom of navigation is not just about commerce. It's about our national security as well, about strategy. And the senior officers in the front know that this command of the sea gives the state great power. The command of the sea gives a, a state great flexibility. Many options are available when you can control the sea. So why would a country want to control the sea? Well, I can think of a couple of reasons. If I go back to the South China Sea example, uh, and I have a development of missiles that can range up to 250, 500, this is kilometers. Uh, the DF-21 Delta, 1,000 nautical miles, right? Uh, I can reach out very far and deny the sea. But why? Because not only is the commerce that flows through this region important, but it creates a flexibility. Because he who commands the sea can also influence the countries around him. Whether it's on the Korean Peninsula, whether it's on the Japanese islands, whether it's in Southeast Asia, or if we're seeing increasingly uh, out of area deployments in the Indian Ocean, and even this month into the Baltic. We have a desire to be at sea, not just because of the commercial possibilities, but because of the strategic flexibility that it offers.
and the ability to project influence around the world. So when I think now about the South China Sea again, and I'm thinking initially I might also think about what's some of the other purposes of having to see power. When I think about these disputed islands, when I think about the number of resource extraction opportunities, all these oil and gas in the natural gas, when I think about the amount of shipping coming through the Strait of Malaga and up to the South China Sea, to and from the Chinese port, it's just about commerce, but I've been thinking about other things. Yes, the communication between the both in physical and in digital terms. Maneuver. But this is a great highway that I can use to move forces. If they're contested on land, I'll go around, just as General MacArthur did in there. Perhaps simply by having access to the ocean, I can affect the thinking politically on shore. But I can influence the politics by projecting my presence. But also as a joint white war fighter, as someone who is going to oscillate with joint forces, I know that I can be a, uh, a lever, right? I can increase the power of the other forces by oscillating effectively as well. And we've talked about the creation and denial of the opportunities. But this is very much on the minds of Chinese leaders as well. They've stated themselves, Hu Jintao says, we should enhance our capacity for exploiting marine resources, resolutely safeguard China's maritime rights and interests, and build China into a maritime power. These are the words of the leader who is thinking about a growing economy, a burgeoning middle class, a country that is hungry for resources, producing required much mental and resources. And these ideas were then followed by his, uh, by his successor. De su sucesor. With a país the common fellowship of the maritime spirit, if they do so with the same investment in this international system that depends upon the sea and the free navigation of the sea for commercial gains. However, we grow concerns, right? We see that small reefs have been expanded into now fortresses. That despite promises that there will be no militarization of these islands, we see in fact that there is no positioning of radars and maritime control aircraft, et cetera. And we grow concerned that this portion of the world, where nearly three to five trillion dollars of trade flows every year, may be under threat. It's uncertain. We don't know. But it does make one And it shows here the, the stakes that different countries have. 
la preocupación o el involucramiento de diferentes países. La mayoría de estos países, creo que esto es Corea del Sur, Singapur, Hong Kong, Vietnam, Tailandia, Japón, Indonesia, the rest of the world has an awful lot to care about in South China Sea. The United States doesn't have any support in South China But the Chinese are equally concerned. So what we hope for as we build the maritime fellowship is that we build a compañerismo from a position of our maritime values to the bedrock of foundational values of this maritime Está dentro de nuestros intereses y de los suyos también. Simplemente déjame hacer una breve and now I'll speak more to the, to the junior audience but uh, we need to remember that what we do as naval officers is only part of the national interest and like any good team like any good orchestra our, our music our efforts are increased in a joint endeavor Diplomáticas I offer this to you tiempo. why? Les presento esto por qué? Because not Porque because we need to coordinate ourselves to our joint partners, it's because we need to explain to our joint partners what is so important at sea. It's important for them to understand the difference between minor strategy and major strategy. Whereas my strategy, according to Clausewitz, the structure on the left, is the use of the engagement for the purpose of the war. The major strategy, seated in a bigger context, here is the Julian Corbett says, major strategy deals with the whole resources of the nation for war. All of it. A branch of statesmanship, political diplomatic, commercial and financial This is something that we understand as naval officers. Why do we understand it? Because we walk outside of the auditorium and we see the port. We see the commercial diplomatic and financial position as every day. We see the commercial diplomatic and financial position as every day. We sail amidst it. Compartimos una mística. And we are encountering what the rest of our society does not encounter until they go to the grocery store tonight to pick up their dinner at home. Our challenge is to communicate this to them every day. The challenge that I offer to you all, whether you are a junior cadet or you are an admiral in the front row, is to and start strategically and strategically and quite frankly, it's not just a joint military problem. This is a problem of our society. This is a problem of our economy.
and it's a problem that's going to require a partnership. Thank you.